So welcome all to our seminar on Aboriginal land and renewable energy. My name's Heidi Norman. I'm a research professor at the University of Technology, Sydney, where I lead the Indigenous Land and Justice Research Hub. Um, on, on our behalf, I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation upon whose ancestral lands our city campus now stands. I pay respects to elders, both past and present, as the traditional custodians for this land. And in, in terms of where I'm coming from, from Zoom land, um, I acknowledge the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of this country and um, their elders past and present, and also in La Perouse Land Council, who has um, custodianship and responsibility and, um, and uh, is recognised in, in relation to this land where I am today. This seminar is brought to you by the Indigenous Land and Justice Research Hub. And today we have partnered with the Climate Justice Research Centre and their series on the emerging frontier on the theme, Emerging Frontiers and Issues in Climate and Environmental Justice. Um, about the speakers. Um, today's seminar has a great lineup of experts on Aboriginal land, economy and renewable energy. We have asked them to share their knowledge about renewable energy and the Aboriginal land state. We anticipate an enormous amount of information will be covered today and for that reason we will be recording the session in case you want to watch it again or if there's anything that you miss. Our speakers will broadly address employment and training opportunities, social license, policy levers for beneficial outcomes, LAUC ambitions and lastly some examples from Canada on Indigenous led renewables. We thank our speakers in advance for your generosity in sharing your expertise um, with us and with some 200 um, re registrants. We will have time at the end for questions and if you are inclined you can continue the conversation on Twitter. Firstly, uh, let's begin with an introduction to the topic of renewable energy and the Aboriginal land estate. So I'll just take about eight minutes um, before we hear from our first speaker. In this brief intro, I'm, I mean, I'm keen to provide some background context about the Aboriginal land estate, how Aboriginal land and renewable energy are, um, can be seen to be interla interlinked, the changing policy context and some examples of engagement in renewable energy in New South Wales. So firstly, let's very briefly look at what, what we mean by the Aboriginal land estate. As you can see from this slide, the Aboriginal land estate, um, the two predominant mechanisms, the Land Rights Act from 1983, state law and Commonwealth Native Title Act, are the predominant mechanisms for the return of land. So the Aboriginal land estate in New South Wales sits at approximately, this is based on 2019 data, it will have changed over time, uh, less than 2% um, of the land of New South Wales. So the Aboriginal land estate is small. It is likely to increase. It will have to increase. Um, it's not, and it's also not insignificant. So of this land holdings, we can see that approximately 80% of Aboriginal land holdings is zoned conservation. So that places Aboriginal landholders in, in a, a key role in terms of mitigating uh, climate change and driving new economies in towns where um, we see conditions of declining traditional economies and, um, and where there's white flight. So really there, is, um, there are lots of factors that place the Aboriginal land estate and renewable energy in very close um, interface, if you like. And, and if we have a look at the next slide, we, we see that um, in terms of the distribution of land by local Aboriginal land councils, we can see that there's a significant distribution of land along the East Coast. Um, and these do not necessarily map onto what we're gonna talk about today or what some of our speakers will emphasize in terms of these identified renewable energy zones. But that's not to say that there isn't a clear overlap, but um, I, I guess I'm, what I'm wanting to do here is just provide some brief context for what, what the land estate, the Aboriginal land estate looks like. And if we go to our next slide, um, we can just see a, a brief sort of statistical out, um, breakdown of, um, of um, the land holdings, Aboriginal land holdings. Now, just to turn briefly to think about um, the uh, renewable energy zones, um, and that in, a, in part is what um, is the focus of our um, attention today. So just again, by way of brief background, in December 2020, the New South Wales government passed the Electricity Infrastructure Investment Act. It's a plan to transition New South Wales to renewable energy in the next 15 years. 
So the, the ambition is to take advantage of the state's renewable energy and pumped hydro resources and to improve the state transmission to support new energy generation projects. They described it as an ambitious plan that will, that will position New South Wales as an energy super, superpower. Under the Electricity Infrastructure Act, the New South Wales government will coordinate investment in new generation storage and network infrastructure in New South Wales. So they've committed at this stage 380,000 million to key areas known as renewable energy zones. And these, these include um, uh, New England, Southwest, Hunter Coast, Hunter Central Coast and Illawarra. And the next slide should show some of those areas. So you can see at least um, that initial pilot, the Arana is, Western Arana is um, the sort of town epicenter is Dubbo. Now, what is significant for our consideration is that the objects of the Act, so this Electricity and Infrastructure Act, include to increase employment and income opportunities for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in New South Wales, to promote consultation and negotiation with Aboriginal communities. It, the, laws willing, the laws have mandated the development of a set of explicit guidelines or principles for engaging with Aboriginal peoples, and that includes in relation to energy infrastructure. So we see this as a significant moment, and our intention is to contribute to the discussion and commit resources um, in our capacity as researchers in order um, to support Aboriginal landholders achieve their aspirations. Our research underway indicates a high level of interest on the part of Louts in renewable energy for, for energy security. So thinking about um, where energy security is unreliable, where you have blackouts, where um, you have diesel generators on backup to say, support um, even you know, um, basic supply of electricity that will support um, dialysis, um, op operational dialysis, for, so for health services, um, and in terms of supply, so um, um, to lower the cost of of, of electricity, of energy in, in relation to individual households, family units. Um, secondly, as a commercial or wealth generating land enterprise and in terms of employment and training, directly related to renewable energy projects. So you might think about um, the planning, cultural heritage, cleaning, maintenance, and then allied economies. So in that we might think about um, 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 like accommodation and catering for the big workforces that will be around in terms of the, the building of these projects and, and et cetera. So, you know, those sort of allied economies will be, will be manifest. At this stage, there are no examples in New South Wales of renewable energy enterprises on Aboriginal land, although there are some in early stages of negotiation that, that for example, in terms of easement access for the building of infrastructure in one case that we know of. Um, now, I just want to just, um, before we hand over to our first speaker, which there's one other um, piece of this jigsaw puzzle that is worth us considering. And that is related to, if we go to the next slide, we will see that the um, Close the Gap, which is now the national and state government um, Aboriginal affairs architecture, and um, it set, will set policy and program priorities. It includes an agreement with the, um, with peak Aboriginal organisations to deliver positive outcomes. You can see here from these closing the gap um, that comes from the refresh and the national agreement. And just for the sake of brevity, I want us to highlight um, outcome eight in the closing the gap refresh, which emphasises strong economic participation and development of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities. And secondly, by 2030, a 15% increase in Australia's land mass subject to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's legal rights or interests. And that is also matched in terms of um, water and sea rights. So these, um, I'm, I'm gonna finish up there, but what I've, what I've just by way of brief introduction, what I've emphasized is the Aboriginal land estate, the renewable energy zones, and now this um, closing the gap architecture that will push down to state governments um, uh, the necessity to achieve particular land outcomes. Okay, so that's that in a sense guides why we are here and um, it will um, create the context on which the rest of our speakers um, speak. So our first speaker is Justin, Justin Coburn. Justin is from Beyond, Beyond Energy Solutions and he has over 20 years experience working in community development, 
primarily with Indigenous peoples overseas and in Australia. Over the past four years, he's been actively involved in developing innovative ways to engage and benefit those communities where large scale solar farms are being built. Thanks for your time, Justin, and I'll hand over to you. Thanks everyone, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm coming from Wadharong country in Geelong, Victoria, and I'd like to acknowledge um, the people, the traditional owners of Wadharong, um, past, present and future. So I'm going to just share my screen here now. Uh, just check we've got that. We got that. You got that Heidi? Yep, yep, we can see that. Thanks, Justin. Okay. So I'm going to speak about what I know about best at the moment is opportunities for Aboriginal peoples and businesses to participate and benefit from large scale solar farms, uh, the development and particularly focusing on employment, training and procurement are those three areas that I will be focusing on. So I work with, um, sorry, I'm just trying to move that slide. I work with Beyond it. Energy Solutions, we're a construction company. We've built, I think we're up to our seventh large scale solar farm. Um, we've installed well over a million panels across uh, various projects throughout Australia. More recently, we've been focusing on our work in New South Wales, um, and we're currently building a solar farm up near Armadale, which is part of the renewable energy zone up there. And in addition to that work, I'm also the chair of the Clean Energy Council's Social Licence and uh, Community Engagement Working Group. And as part of that group, we're really focusing on best practice in re relation to engagement of local Aboriginal communities. So I suppose from our perspective, I mean, the opportunity to participate in large scale solar, firstly, host the solar farm on, on your land. Um, Secondly, develop and build a partnership with a developer. And the third one is employment, training and supply of products and services. And that's the area I wanted to focus on today. Um, I can take questions on the other areas, but given the time, I think I'll just focus on that. Um, so in relation to employment, <laughs> we've found that this is a, there's a huge opportunity for participation in large scale solar farms. So traditionally on a large scale solar farm of about 100 megawatts, you would have about a workforce of up to 250 workers. Um, and of that, you would have about half the workforce would be working on the actual mechanical installation of the solar farm. The other half is you have subcontractors and electrical works. But what we found with the mechanical installation is that these jobs are a great opportunity to encourage people who have been um, facing barriers to employment or long-term unemployed to uh, re-engage in the workforce. So we've run specific programs to get Aboriginal people involved and working on our solar farms. And we've done that by partnering with job active organisations, with local councils, and even in the case in Victoria with the Department of Justice, so people on corrections and orders and that type of stuff. So we've had really strong success rates getting uh, Aboriginal people employed on these jobs and we've had them move from one solar farm to the other. And I think the good thing about these jobs is that they are entry level labour jobs. So, you know, you can see in this image here, it's also a lot of women that we're getting in and promoting opportunities on that. Um, one of the other main areas is in relation to, in terms of benefit is in relation to training. Um, so in addition to, providing employment, we are also promoting um, pre-employment training. So as part of that, we sort of try and partner, partner with local TAFEs to look at the ways we can get people job ready, particularly those who have been uh, long-term unemployed. So, you know, it varies, but it's looking between a week and two weeks of pre-employment training to get people job ready. But then once they're on the job, we try and provide mentoring and ongoing support. There's a huge opportunity in the renewable energy zones with a lot of projects coming in the next few years for employment and training opportunities. And it's the industry now is, and I know DPIE, New South Wales government as well, is really looking into how to maximise the benefits on this. Um, and so we're working with them at the moment and with the Clean Energy Council to try and encourage this type of employment opportunities, training opportunities. The other thing to note is that unfortunately, a lot of these jobs are short term jobs. They're only 
three or four months of duration. So the idea is to build people's skills up so that they can move from one sort of job to another, ideally. So for example, in the in New, New England Re Renewable Energy Zone, there are, we're building a solar farm now and there's about eight more to come in that one region. So there's a lot of work opportunities to come. One of the um, real areas that we need to investigate and the, one of the greatest benefits we've found is in relation to apprenticeships. So for example, when we built a couple of solar farms in Victoria a couple of years ago, we put on 25 electrical apprentices. Nine of those were um, Aboriginal workers. Uh, and I think two of those were women. And that was a really successful program in terms of, you know, not just focusing on these kind of um, entry level jobs, but looking also at the um, ability to create these apprenticeships, which basically lead to not only long term employment, but to careers. And that's been really successful. And I think that's something that really needs to be pushed within the renewable energy zones is training and apprenticeships and particularly the apprenticeships. And what that requires is industry support because the challenge is trying to move when people are moving jobs they're actually move, projects are going to be moving um, employment employees as well. So they need to go through group trainings, but that's a real opportunity and potential benefit that needs to be in, uh, explored further. In addition to employment and training is also the procurement opportunities. So for example, we had, we built a um, solar farm recently just outside of Wagga in a place called Bowman. And in addition to employing about 150 locals, and I think 40 of whom were Aboriginal, we also employed 70 local businesses. And there's a huge opportunity for, for local Aboriginal businesses to be involved. We have engaged with a number of those as well. Um, so you know, there's, there's equipment and products and various services that are available as well for these um, various businesses. So this is all, these are the opportunities, but it requires um, engagement, early engagement right from the start so that not only are these businesses, local Aboriginal businesses given the opportunity to participate, but giving some support and capacity building in that process, because some of these projects uh, have a lot of requirements around health and safety, documentation, that type of stuff, which for small local businesses can be a bit overwhelming. So it's incumbent on these project developers and construction companies to provide support and services to local Aboriginal businesses and other businesses to be able to step up and meet those requirements and build their capacity. And the opportunity is if you can do it on one, one solar farm or one renewable energy project, there's the opportunity to move on to other projects as well. Um, so that's a real benefit. You know, there's after the construction, there's also the operations and maintenance uh, phase. So things like ground, ground cover management, vegetation management, um, or also, you know, a lot of these solar farms are now looking at um, sheep and grazing. So all these different types of opportunities exist. Um, so I'm just um, conscious of the time. So I think I'll finish up there to, just by way of conclusion. But the key points are there are, there are many um, positive ways to participate that can benefit local Aboriginal people, communities and businesses. Um, but it does require, it's incumbent on the uh, developers and <coughs> the construction companies to engage early and proactively. And as part of that engagement process is about setting targets around employment, training and apprenticeships and the use of local um, businesses and providing support, ongoing support, so that it's not just a short term fix, but it's actually building people's capacities and businesses capacities to go on and participate and benefit from what's going to be a huge industry in the renewable energy sector. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Heidi. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to call up now Alana West. So Alana is with um, is a community engagement officer with Realliance. Realliance is an advocacy organisation that places renew, re, regional renewal at the centre of the clean power transformation. And she's also doing her PhD with us at the UTS Climate Justice Centre. So over to you, Alana. I think we've got you down for 10 minutes. 
All right, hi everyone. I also just want to acknowledge that I'm calling in today from the unceded Gadigal lands um, of the Eora Nation and want to pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, but I also want to acknowledge uh, the land of the Wurundjeri, um, Waiwan and Gamilaroi peoples, um, whose land the Central West Arana Renewable Energy Zone is currently situated on. Um, and that's where I'm doing a lot of uh, engagement work at the moment. Um, so yes, uh, Re-Alliance or the Renewable Energy Alliance is an advocacy organisation that is working um, in the specifically at the moment in the Central West, um, but also more broadly in New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania to try to ensure that regional communities benefit from the transition to renewable energy. Um, I'm going to talk briefly today about different ways that we can um, advocate to government and industry um, to ensure that Aboriginal communities benefit um, from the rollout of these renewable energy zones. Um, and apologies if I sound a little funny, I've recently had jaw surgery and half my face is still kind of numb. Um, <laughs> so the first, um, I guess, point of intervention that I want to talk to you about today is through um, the new implementation of policy and regulations. So as Heidi mentioned, um, in New South Wales, there's new legislation um, which is going to be basically allows for us to establish these five new renewable energy zones. Um, the Central West Arana is the pilot renewable energy zone, and it's set to be shovel ready by 2022, the beginning of 2022, uh, end of 2022, sorry. Um, and what that means is that basically the, um, there's going to be a bunch of like a big transmission line that's going to be built um, uh, that goes out to the Central West and then a whole bunch of projects up to 3000 megawatts of projects will be able to connect to that transmission line. Um, when they say shovel ready by the end of 2022, that means starting to build that transmission line. Um, so we have this really interesting time that we're in right now where the government is um, seeking advice and consulting um, with industry and various other groups around, I guess, like what the process for the establishment of these reses should be. Um, and one thing that I think is a really important tool that um, all of us in this webinar can, um, you know, try to use to push for more benefits for Aboriginal communities in the rollout of reses um, is what's currently being called the merit criteria assessment. So to give you a bit of a sense of the interest that there is in um, building solar, wind, battery, storage, hydro projects um, in these renewable energy zones, the New South Wales government put out an expression of interest for projects in the Central West Res, and they had um, 27,000 megawatts of energy capacity, which is over nine times um, what is going to be available in that renewable energy zone. What the government is going to be doing, I guess, to choose which projects um, get to attach to the transmission line, so which projects get to be part of the res, um, is they're going to basically assess projects against a merit criteria. What that merit criteria looks like, they're still finalising, but on the right of my screen here is what they've got as their draft merit criteria. Um, and I've highlighted three, which I think are very useful for our purposes in wanting to advocate for stronger benefits for Aboriginal communities. And so, individual projects will apply to um, yeah, be a part of the res and they'll be assessed against this criteria. Um, and so things like social impact and local economic benefits and compatibility with farming, individual projects and renewable energy developers are going to need to show how their project is um, benefiting the local community, how it's bringing local economic benefits. Um, and so there's a real opportunity there for us to be working with industry um, to set up 
partnerships um, and projects and you know other kinds of benefits um, which I'll talk to a little bit later um, so that those projects can get bumped up um, and hopefully you know get chosen um, to be a, a project in the res. Um, so that's a really interesting uh, I guess policy lever that we have is this merit criteria. Um, another really useful point of in intervention is this idea of social license. Um, and so people have probably heard about this, but for those of you that haven't, a social license refers to basically that um, an industry or a company or a project um, basically is seen as socially acceptable or legitimate by the community where that project is being carried out. Um, so we've seen a lot of discussion in Australia and around the world really about how the fossil fuel industry has been losing its social license. Um, and as we move towards renewable energy, both the industry and the government is very interested in ensuring that the renewable energy industry more broadly, but renewable energy zones in particular, um, have social license and are something that the communities where these reses are established actively want them there um, rather than merely tolerating them or outright opposing them. Um, and so I've just included this little graph on, on this presentation. Um, uh, an academic, an Australian academic basically did a bit of um, unpacking of what is included in creating a social license. Um, there's the direct benefits, but there's also the engagement part. Um, and so both industry and government are going to be looking for ways and are already starting to look for ways to build their social license in uh, the communities where um, renewable energy zones are going to be held. Um, and again, for um, social license, a lot of companies are beginning to you know, think through uh, what specific benefits Aboriginal communities um, can be provided uh, as part of building this, this social license. Um, so it's a really, it's a really key thing um, for us to think through it because it is something that industry and government are very interested in, in achieving and maintaining. Um, these, we've been having conversations um, and engaging with people in the Central West, um, but also more broadly, um, including some First Nations advocacy organisations um, around what some of the things that we can be advocating for in um, building social licence. Um, and so thankfully, Justin spoke about some of the, the training and employment opportunities, but there are also broader things that we can be um, advocating for. Um, and these include the establishment of engagement protocols that uphold um, free prior and informed consent, um, you know, including First Nations people um, in the project design and planning of both individual projects, but also of the uh, renewable energy zones more broadly. Um, there's the idea of having um, partnerships between um, LAUCs and renewable energy proponents where LAUCs can uh, lease land to host solar or wind or transmission infrastructure and get the annual returns um, that, that come from hosting those projects. Um, there's also lots of other types of benefits that these, these big projects bring. Um, so often projects will establish things like community enhancement funds, um, scholarships, uh, sponsorships. They'll also occasionally offer things like co-investment and co-ownership in, in projects. Um, they also offer, sometimes offer in-kind donations, um, you know, instead of ordering, you know, 10,000 solar panels, they might order 11,000 and donate a thousand of them to local community housing, things like that. Um, and there's really kind of, you know, the sky is, is the limit in terms of what these kinds of benefits can look like. Um, but a key challenge, but also a key opportunity is that um, 
from the conversations we've been having with um, some, I guess, people in industry is there's an interest in exploring what specific benefits there can be for Aboriginal communities and for Laos. Um, but there's a lack of understanding of how to go about doing that um, and even how to approach or engage um, from, from the industry perspective. Um, so there haven't been heaps of examples in Australia. Um, you know, there's a few here and there, um, but not very many examples uh, of, you know, direct partnerships between um, Aboriginal communities and renewable energy proponents um, with Beyond Energy. Um, so Justin's organisation is a, is a um, notable exception um, and they're doing really great work. So yeah, there's a lot of different things that we can be fighting for. Um, we have some guidebooks coming out soon um, and we've done some, some consultation with the department around this kind of thing. Um, but one thing that I guess I want to impress upon everybody here today is that now is the time for us to be advocating for this type of stuff. So even though the Central West is the pilot renewable energy zone, a lot of what is being um, decided upon at the moment and over the coming you know, 18 months um, is going to be, is going to set up how all five renewable energy zones um, are rolled out. So we're in this really important moment right now where you know, the department and industry are seeking, um, are seeking to engage and are seeking to hear feedback on how these renewable energy zones can be rolled out. Um, here I've just put up what is quite a, like a confusing um, little uh, figure, but it's the latest um, in the New South Wales Department um, uh, DPI's consultation plan um, for the reses. So you can see here they've got just like a bunch of different papers and guidelines that haven't come out yet. Um, and each time they put one out, they, they do seek um, feedback and consultation. Um, so not only are there, is there this kind of consultation where you can respond to things that they're putting out, I would also urge everybody to start proactively engaging. And if you can, try to set up meetings with DPI, try to send them your research. Um, because yeah, now's really the time for us to be um, to be advocating for these benefits. And I'll wrap up there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alana. That's great. Now, um, next up, we have Elizabeth McDonald. Elizabeth is a lawyer with um, Chalk and Barrett. And she has over 15 years experience in native title, clean energy and all areas of property law. She's negotiated native title agreements and Aboriginal cultural heritage management plans for a range of major projects across Australia. She's also advised on tenure governance and policy issues under the Land Rights Act and the Queensland Aboriginal Land Act. Uh, in 2019, she received an Australian Government Executive Leadership Award for clean energy. So thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks so much, Heidi, and um, what a great um, event that you've put together today. Thank you. Um, look, I've prepared my presentation as a video um, because I wanted Laux to be able to share it um, amongst any members and um, you know, board members, staff who, who couldn't be part of this today. So I'll share that now. I would like to acknowledge the Pamelon clan of the Orbical people, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm standing. I thank them for protecting the incredible beaches and bushland in this area since time immemorial. Sovereignty of this land was never ceded and treaties remain yet to be negotiated. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and also to the First Nations people who are watching this video. I hope you find it useful. My name is Elizabeth McDonnell. I work with a Sydney-based firm called Chalk and Barrett and our lawyers have worked with local Aboriginal land councils in New South Wales for decades. I'm based in Newcastle, and I've spent the last 15 years specialising in property law, clean energy, and Aboriginal land rights. At the start of my career, clean energy projects I was involved in were backed by fund managers who were positioning themselves to be ready for an increase in demand in ethical investments in the future. The projects had many stumbling blocks, because the clean energy industry in this country was still very new. 
Everything was evolving from the policy landscape to community attitudes and of course the technology. Fast forward to the last five years and the projects I've been involved in have been different. In particular, there are a lot more organisations developing projects in Australia. The prices of solar and wind installations have dropped significantly. Um, so the cost of solar panels decreased about 90% since 2009 and the cost of wind turbines has dropped around 55% since 2010. We're also seeing successful projects of very different scales here in Australia. There are some of the biggest projects in the world being developed here, but there are also a lot of community scale projects, microgrid pilots, and we've become the world leaders in rooftop solar. Finally, here in New South Wales at least, we're seeing government policy designed to support renewable energy. This country is transitioning to renewable energy solutions. That's a given. It will eventually impact all of us. It's important that Aboriginal landholders across New South Wales have the opportunity to work out what they want the clean energy transition to mean for them. Last week I had a conversation about this with Nikki Ison, who's been one of the trailblazers for community energy in Australia and who is now WWF Australia's energy transition manager. One of the amazing things about renewables is it's scalable. So, you know, you get solar cells that you can put on a tracker of a koala or embedded in your um, you know, jacket all the way up to the largest power projects in the world. So, you know, every household can benefit, um, but also every community can also benefit. So like we can do it at a household scale, at a community scale and at, and at a really large scale. I think that's the opportunity, whether we're maximising the opportunity and maximising the benefits to the people who should benefit, um, is very much the question I think we should be asking because, uh, you know, all of this happens on Aboriginal land uh, in Australia and at the moment, very clearly, Aboriginal communities and people are not getting the benefits of this transition. So how do we maximise the opportunities for Laux? To start with, how about we learn from past experiences? My colleagues and I have acted for native title claim groups and PBCs in other states across Australia in future act negotiations with mining companies. As the clean energy policy is developed in New South Wales, there's a lot that the government could learn from what hasn't worked well in the native title framework with respect to mining projects. To be honest, I could talk all day about that, but I wanna focus on two critical points. Firstly, the native title policy framework generally hasn't supported native title claim groups and PBCs to do the deep strategic work they need to do. As a result, it's very hard for claim groups and PBCs to take an active role in shaping or co-designing the projects on their land. Instead, they are put in a position of reacting to proposals put forward by mining companies. The New South Wales Clean Energy Framework should resource Laux so that they can develop their own clean energy strategies. Turning back to my conversation with Nikki Ison, I mean, one of the things we're hoping in the, I know they're in the process at the moment of developing these um, guidelines uh, in relation to uh, renewable energy zones in, in New South Wales and the guidelines for how that might look for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander participation. Um, I, I, we really hope that what that will look like is not just kind of a, a benefit um, or a, a, a passive role, but um, a bit building expectation opportunity around the, the, that to be whatever role that an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community wants to take, whether it could be a very active role. For some people, it might not be that active role, but um, I think there's things that to be a real opportunity in that policy making that we have right now that was a failure in the Native Title Act in relation to mining. That could be a tool to actually bring people to, you know, organisations together um, rather than just something, a ticker box exercise. I absolutely agree, and I, I, yeah, I think it, ha it has to be a process, and that we need to look at how we can use the different uh, levers or, or processes that are going on to embed, um, you know, engagement with uh, an active role for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in in the development of, of the energy system of the future. Um, what we see, I think, in relation to the renewable energy zones, at least for communities knowing where they will be, um, is a potential opportunity for those um, those communities to start thinking now, well, 
what skills do we want in the next few years? What If we want to be involved in that, what would it look like and what do we need to get there? Absolutely. And, you know, this is it's one of the powerful things around the renewable energy zone model is that it's not project by project, but a whole um, you know area and pro- planning process um, at, over a period of time. Uh, and I think the skills development piece, you're right, is is one of the ones that that is the early one of the earliest pieces that is needed. Um, you know, for every you know for people in that whole community, like across the board. You know, how, what are the skills development needed to then capture the opportunities? Um, I, I suppose it's skills, but it's also um, some key positions, like some roles that will that are, are focused in that community in pr- developing. Like one of the things that I've learned in doing community energy over the last decade or more is that things don't happen by themselves like it takes coordination and effort and who does that coordination and effort now typically it's like volunteers and people who have who are privileged enough to be able to volunteer or have some real skin in the game and a real urgency around it to be able to do that but I think that that is um too weak a model and and it it risks missing the opportunities uh, um and and to do things badly so like how do we encourage state and federal governments to capacitate the communities not just to the the communities in the renewable energy zone locations to have some in the form of sort of coordination and expertise and uh uh support um to you know go all right to co-design the training program, to co-design the benefit sharing approach, to activate a whole range of different individuals and organisations to get together to go, how do we you know, co-own this new wind farm opportunity or you know, develop a policy proposal that would develop a new industry or you know, there, there's a whole myriad of opportunities and I don't want to prejudge those, um, but it, it needs that coordination. Um, and it needs that coordination to be well resourced. Secondly, the Native Title Act only gives Native Title Claim Groups and PBCs a very limited right to negotiate with mining companies. The New South Wales Clean Energy Framework needs to ensure that there is meaningful and early engagement between industry and LAUX. Is that realistic? Absolutely. So with renewable energy companies, they most of the um, big organisations that I talk to have, have suddenly learned that in relation to community engagement, going early makes sense. Um, not just from a it's the right thing to do perspective, but from a business perspective, because Absolutely. if they get community um, communities on board, then approvals are easier to get through. Like there's all these things that become easier, and that's good for the bottom line. Um, so we know that they can do it, and I think we um, if there is that. Um, yeah, as you say, we have these different levers. We push pull these different levers in a way that encourages that early, um, early communication, early relationship building. Um, in that same way, I think that could generate some really interesting outcomes. Early engagement won't just benefit Laux. There are some practical reasons why it's also in the best interest of clean energy companies to be engaging early. Why? Well, when a clean energy company is honing in on an area where they want to develop a project, they will eventually start looking at the title searches to work out who owns what. If a parcel of land has been claimed under the Aboriginal Land Rights Act or is awaiting transfer to a LAUC, the title search won't tell the company the whole story. Why? The best person to explain that is our managing principal, Jason Barrett. Jason has been involved in nearly every land claim appeal under the Aboriginal Land Rights Act in the past 20 years. If a land claim appeal is successful, how long does it take for the land to be transferred to the, to the LAUC? Uh, it depends. Um, if the land is already surveyed, it is likely to be less than three months. Um, normally, when there are land claim appeals in the court, the standard order is six months. But if the land uh, is needs to be surveyed, including whether there's easements that need to be created, then it can take substantially longer. 
Um, historically, a lot of land claims have been granted and have waited many years to be transferred pri primarily because of lack of surveying. That's improved in recent years, um, but there can still be a substantive delay. And during that time, um, if you do a title search, it would show the, um, the Crown still as the, um, the owner of the land until the land is transferred? That's right. So in, in New South Wales, it's um, where the Crown is the owner. It is, um, it's the state of New South Wales, which is listed as the registered proprietor, and that will stay the same until it's transferred to the Land Council. Often the land claimed might be subject to a reservation. Um, when the land is transferred, what happens to the reservation? Um, Section 3610 of the Aboriginal Land Rights Act says um, that when the land is transferred, any reservation or dedication on the land is revoked. If a land claim is lodged over a title, does that show up on the title search? Nope. No. Nope. Um, the Registrar of... Um, the Aboriginal Land Rights Act keeps a register, um, but it's not connected to the land title system, um, so it, it, it won't show up. So what this means is that if a clean energy company is just looking at title searches, they might cross land off their list because it looks like it's Crown land subject to a reservation, even though that land may later be transferred to a LAUG and the reservation will drop off. This process and timing might prevent a LAUG from having the opportunity to be involved in a clean energy project. What happens if a company is interested in leasing or licensing land under claim? I think the starting point for that issue is, however, that if from the date the Aboriginal land claim is lodged, if the land, claim, if the land is claimable Crown land, there is a statutory duty to transfer it. The, position of the government at least appears to be that if someone wants to deal with a land that's under claim, the government will only grant an interest if the land council has consented to it. Now, depending on the nature of the interest, um, uh, that, that may not um, provide an easy answer. If someone is after a longer term interest on the land, um, it wouldn't be easy to carry over um, a, a lease or licence um, to the land council, um, it would have to be negotiated again. So in that instance, there, there might be a range of other options that the land council and the third party may want to look at, look at um, to uh, reach an agreement as to what might happen with that land. So that's a practical reason why it's important, but there are also broader considerations. Well, I think there's always um, a need for industry working in a particular region to work with their the local Aboriginal community. That's not just because of land rights, that's about relationships and dealing with uh, country um, and particularly ma major projects. Um, these days um, there is obviously a great aware awareness in industry to um, in involve Indigenous people um, in uh, um, projects on their on their land um, that that should be a goal regardless of whether or not indigenous people happen to own the land um, Aboriginal people in New South Wales um, only have native title rights or or uh, rights under the land rights act over very limited areas um, but the um, the relationships that should be built with them um, extend beyond um, the land that they they actually own. Um, the broader issue as to um, where there's crown land that might be of interest to um, energy companies, um, obviously as part of their due diligence, they need to know who the owner is and what the likelihood of them getting the type of tenure that they want um, to be able to sec um, securely and reasonably d develop whatever project they need. Um, and they, um, they won't be able to do that unless they understand the land rights and native title implications of um, where, they're, where they're operating. Um, obviously, in terms of wanting to do something in future, then um, that has to be negotiated, and it's always easier to negotiate with a community where you've got a better re relationship and where um, the community feel that there is, um, uh, the relationship is beneficial to them. In, in the longer term. Let's turn now to what a LAUP clean energy strategy could look like. This will depend 
on what the lark wants to achieve and where their land is located. Do they want to achieve lower energy prices for their members? Is it an income stream for the lark? Better opportunities to live and work locally? Or energy sovereignty? The answers to those questions will be critical to determining what the best options might be for a lark. For example, if a lark identified that they have vacant land located near transmission lines and their goal is to diversify their income streams, they may be able to consider using their vacant land for a clean energy project. The most basic model will be to lease their land to a company who will install a solar array or wind turbines as part of a large scale project. The benefit that the Lao could receive from that kind of arrangement is not just limited to rent, it could, for example, be a profit share arrangement for the Lauk and its members. A Lauk who has the same kind of land and wants to achieve cheaper energy prices for their members, as well as moving towards energy sovereignty, might be able to join forces with a company and a community energy group and co-design a project. Lauks considering that path might be interested in these two models. The first is a shared community battery project. In this model, a number of households are selected to be part of the project. Some have rooftop solar and some don't. Some people own their homes and some don't. The houses that do have rooftop solar generate electricity. During the middle of the day, they will no doubt generate more electricity than they need. And that electricity can be used by other households or it can be stored in the battery. There's an energy technology platform that deals with that. Any unused energy can be sold back to the energy grid during the night so that it'll get the best price. There's a shared community battery project currently in development in New South Wales, which I recommend keeping an eye on. The second model is a solar garden. This model is focused on getting benefits to people who can't install solar on their roof. The slide shows a model used overseas for a resident owned community. As you can see, there's a solar array and then several different parties the community members who buy energy, their community organisation, which provided the land for the solar array to be built on, a utility company, which is responsible to power the community, and a solar developer, which built the solar array. The members all get credits on their bills for the energy they create. There's a solar garden project in development in New South Wales. It looks a little bit different to this model because of the Australian policy and laws, but the concept is the same. These models aren't just relevant to Lauks with the right land assets. Lauks who don't have those kind of land assets could be involved in one of those projects by teaming with a community partner. One important thing to consider if a Lauk is using its own land will be native title. And I can talk separately about that. These models are really just to get you thinking. There are going to be lots of different opportunities and models, particularly as we see the regulatory framework start to change. This is a once in a generation opportunity to redesign the energy industry in New South Wales. Let's find ways for Lauks to co-opt the innovative new ideas for the benefit of Aboriginal people across New South Wales. Thanks for listening. I'm sure I'm about to run out of time. I just wanted to add Look, there haven't been many energy projects um, which have significantly involved Aboriginal um, landowners um, today, particularly in New South Wales. We're actively um, working to change that and to position Lauks well for an engaging with industry. Um, and that's what's really exciting about being able to collaborate today. Okay, now, next up, we're going to hear from Darubin Lauk. Uh, first up, um, let me just... Um, mentioned that Darubin Lauk is a local Aboriginal land council based in Western Sydney, generally. Um, they're the largest non-government land holder and they have a commitment to developing their land to create opportunities for the Aboriginal community. We have two speakers from Darubin Lauk. First is Graham Davis King. Graham is a board member of, um, of Darubin Lauk. He's a Nyampa artist, activist, warrior and cultural leader. And we also have joining us Stephen Wright, who um, is the Durban Chief Operating Officer. Thanks very much for coming along and, and sharing with us your, um, the beginnings of your discussions and planning around renewable energy on your uh, land. So thanks. Um, no, thank you. Thank you for having us, Heidi, Heidi Norman, and congratulations on this um, webinar. 
um, focusing on solar energy and renewable energies. And, um, and that's 100% what the Durban Local Aboriginal Land Council supports. And we've been talking about that for a long time. Um, uh, well, first of all, I'd just like to say, um, like I'm here at Parramatta, so we're at the, the old jail, would you believe, in the art gallery, um, artists and residents here. And so we're in the incorporated area of the Durban Local Aboriginal Land Council. And we'd like to acknowledge that Aboriginal people have been here um, in our land council area, the Durban, um, since time immemorial, and that we are still here today. And, and actually, um, we, as an Aboriginal organisation, um, we have the largest membership of Aboriginal people in Western Sydney and Aboriginal, any Aboriginal organisation um, in Western Sydney. We also have the biggest property owner in Western Sydney, um, owning um, something like 170 square kilometres or, or um, in, in Western Sydney, which is a significant parcel, um, 170 or 17,000 hectares. So there's, there's a lot of, um, how could I put it? Uh, I, I think like, because we talked a, bit, a little bit about social capital, social, um, um, that um, I think there's a relational power there that we have with the New South Wales government, particularly, but also the federal government, and 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 particularly and probably in this case with um, renewable energies, um, probably a big influence. I, I think we can be a big help um, in in that field of um, renewable energies and also water too. Um, also, which we're in discussion with. So there's a lot of work to do and we've just reached the tip of the iceberg in that. So yeah, I'd like to acknowledge everyone here and congratulations for this conference. Um, yeah, um, also well, some of the projects that we we're looking at um, and I saw some of the questions too, a question about, well, can we do solar in um, um, in Sydney, for example, because our land council is in Western Sydney, and um, I, I think that's that's what we're heading towards. Um, definitely, is um, probably in Sydney. We're probably at the moment um, in a in a practical or material sense, um, without looking at the theory of what we're talking about, but. In a material sense, what we're implementing is that um, houses will be probably solar panelled, solar panelled up, and also they will have a solar battery, and um, which will hopefully be able to back up their system. So um, and and also provide choices for that family in how they want to engage the renewable energies or the or the grid, and um, so that's really what we're looking at. Uh, with the parcels of land that we have, we could set up solar arrays and stuff like that, but we do also have to think about lots of other things to do with the land. So if we we set up, say, a thousand hectares of solar panels in Western Sydney, I, I think there's an impact there. Um, but I, I think um, with if we can build the social housing and the social programs, like in health, housing, education, and employment, and everything, then the the uh, I think then the the, the solar or our, our part in the solar industry um, can be fully met. But there's a lot of work to do, and um, it, we're at the tip of the iceberg. Um, so so yeah, so that's what we're doing with housing development. They'll be having solar panels. They'll have a solar battery. Um, and th these will be put towards councils, local governments, um, who have been a stumbling block of land councils, I've got to say, um, because, we'll, we'll, of course, we've got to go before uh, decision-making panels with LGAs, and um, so they're going to be a significant um, battle for us, um, unless, like, 
if it's a huge solar array of over $30 million or something, um, of course, it's got to go before council. So LGAs have been a struggle for uh, land councils. Um, and it, it's um, because all these people have all sorts of different agendas. Um, like we, we see even in this presentation, there's, um, there's going to be companies, um, well, they're going, to, they're going to want to negotiate with the land council um, to put up their solar arrays. In fact, if they don't um, have to negotiate with the land council and get it out, um, in some sort of process outside of the act um, to get Aboriginal land, um, well, they're probably doing it now. So, so they, they are making impact, uh, I would say. If, uh, and I know that there's a lot of businesses out there and private investors that are doing this now, buying up land and setting up solar farms and stuff like that. So, but it's a, we're a long way from that. But at the moment where we're at though, social housing, solar panels and battery. And also um, the Aboriginal people are, are totally unrepresented, um, very poorly represented as far as having a solar panel on the roof, um, the solar battery, especially, you know, um, that's probably, um, and I know the benefits of having a solar panel because it's a lot cheaper to run your house. And it's great to be able to, to go through summer, for example, not have to pay an electricity bill, that you actually get a $200 check. Um, whereas I know comparable families, um, yeah, they could be paying $700 a quarter or something like that. And um, that's unaffordable um, to me anyway, in our community. Um, also, the other thing that we've been looking at, um, there's uh, um, with the social housing is um, there's, there's also has to do with population movement, um, which we talked about at another conference. And so what a lot of people are doing is moving from, which has happened since the 1970s, um, when there's 38,000 Aboriginal people living in Redfern and have moved out. There's 15,000 up in Central Coast. We've got about 25,000 Aboriginal people in our area, in Durban. And I know there's another 15,000 towards Campbelltown, Liverpool and that. Um, they're looking at, just in Sydney, population of 100,000 Aboriginal people. And, um, but that dot, and I predict that that dot will go out to Western Sydney. Um, there's a big red dot. So the red, big red dot has moved around up the Central Coast, up down to Campbelltown, but it's particularly moved west. And I predict that that dot, the black dot, will move to Penrith. And that's where our focus will be um, probably in the next 10 to 20 years. I, I would dare say, um, making sure that those Aboriginal people, communities, um, important communities, will have um, access to all the resources that are available. And um, so, so, yeah, the solar panel part, the energy part is very important. Thank you, everybody. My name's Steve Wright and I work for Derebin. And can I pass on my family's uh, best wishes to all of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families who are with us in this seminar and, and on the continent? And what I'd like to do is, is speak to the specifics of how renewable energy may be a useful land use for local land councils from Derebin's perspective, but also to point out that it has to be very clear that the local land council understands what it's doing by providing its land for renewable energy in the same way that the local land council needs to clearly understand any land use that it decides to engage in on behalf of its members. One of the difficulties which local land councils have in New South Wales is that often decisions are made about their land without their consent. And this often happens in two contexts. One is before the land is transferred, if it is land claim land, it is continued to be treated as crown land inappropriately. 
or secondly, it's just treated as an extension of the Crown estate. So planning decisions are made which affect the interests and the rights of the land councils as private landowners in ways that don't affect other landowners. And Graham is right that Derribin has a very strong interest in the renewable energy sector, and I'll take you to some specifics of that in a moment. But Derribin also has um, good experience in other land uses wanted by other people being attempted to be imposed on Derribin's land. So for example, if, if zonings for renewable energy areas are thought appropriate by government or by the renewable energy sector or are good for the environment, which they are, that is still not good enough if there is not informed consent by the Aboriginal landowners. So I just caution everybody that we all wanna head in the same direction and we all wanna defeat climate change, but we also wanna make sure we don't treat landowners differently in our move towards doing so. So I'm gonna try and share my screen quickly. So this, this is a piece of work that we did with a company called Flow Systems a couple of years ago. It's demonstrative of the way land councils can engage in renewable energy. I just wanna go through to a plan. So this was a very specific solar capture infrastructure um, piece of work we did on a small piece of land that Derriban owns in Western Sydney. And you'll see that the land is uh, designated there as a solar expansion site, a solar farm and possible future development. So this is, this is an area of only about 35 hectares and Flow Systems told us in this report that even on this 35 hectares, there is a more than viable economic model for the solar farm effectively to be constructed on Derriban's land at, other, at flow's cost and for us to sell the energy back through them into the grid. Now, the reason I, I show you this small example is Derriban owns in excess of two and a half thousand hectares in the Penrith local government area. And we are at the moment negotiating with the New South Wales government to have all of that land included in something called the Cumberland Plain Conservation Plan Strategic Biocertification. The reason we are doing that is that one of the issues which is most challenging for local land councils in establishing any land use on their land of value, and that includes renewable energy, is the operation of the Biodiversity Conservation Act in New South Wales. The Biodiversity Conservation Act is a piece of legislation in New South Wales from 2016, which severely restricts land uses on land which has trees, greenfield land. And it unfairly affects local land council land holdings because the majority of local land council holdings tend to be vegetated parcels. So unless you can resolve the issues under the Biodiversity Conservation Act, it's very difficult to get to very good land uses like renewable energy. So the project you're looking at here is premised on being able to get an outcome on the biodiversity challenges under the Biodiversity Conservation Act. We will achieve that in Western Sydney, we hope through strategic biocertification under the uh, Biodiversity Conservation Act. But it is a great challenge for local land councils because particularly the New South Wales government finds it very difficult to work with land councils outside of the serious constraints in the Biodiversity Conservation Act. So before land councils are able to participate meaningfully in the renewable energy economy, which this report shows we can, that's just the area where we are talking about in Western Sydney, there has to be a very serious policy debate between local land councils and the New South Wales government and those companies in the renewable energy sector who wish to participate with land councils about the operation of biodiversity conservation laws. It's a constraint that we think is unfair. We think the legislation is unfair and it does not in fact enhance the environment. It simply enhances the administration of the legislation. So I, I raise that constraint because that's a, that's a great challenge for land councils. If we think more widely in the Derriban context, 
in the 2,000 hectare footprint that we're currently dealing with in Penrith, 410 hectares will be designated for intensive horticulture and agribusiness. 220 hectares will be designated for a very large scale bushland cemetery. More than 1,000 hectares will be biodiversity conservation lands and about 380 hectares will be for other urban development. Some of that will be large lot residential development because as Graham quite rightly said, a critical issue for local land councils is housing, is shelter for its members in the Aboriginal community it serves. And those issues are being directly impacted by the contest between land for biodiversity conservation and land for the very important public goods that come out of the Aboriginal Land Rights Act. This debate is not solved. And one of the very important messages we would like the renewable energy sector and the community sector to get is that you have to work with us to ameliorate those problems with the Biodiversity Conservation Act. Because if you don't, we can't get these projects properly out of the ground. The outcome that we don't want is that those interested in renewable energy and the government decide what Aboriginal land can be zoned or areas that can be reserved or whatever mechanism they want to use for renewable energy because it suits them. The Land Rights Act prescribes that land councils have to do the best with their land for their members that they can, and that means looking at every available lawful land use. So it becomes a very interesting situation where we always have to be mindful of informed consent. We would welcome some of the programs that other speakers have, have contributed to today, particularly in relation to employment and training on these sort of projects. Derebin can bring the land to these projects. Derebin can bring the people for those works. It just needs to have the Crown interested in providing a legal framework for land councils to deliver these outcomes. And at the moment, that Crown framework is very difficult for land councils in many places. So having suggested those challenges, this small example that I've given you here, which was a proof of concept for us, showed us we can, in fact, have a resource capture initiative. We can capture sunlight, rainwater and stormwater. We can do water production and reuse. We can do renewable energy and we can do waste management. What we can then go for, we can look at affordable housing, employment, agriculture and horticulture, seedlings and tree reforestation, recycling and construction waste, recycling and reuse of organic waste and other sustainably aligned activities. They're all available. And they're all something that the Derribin Local Aboriginal Land Council wants to engage in. But the contest between the Biodiversity Conservation Act and the Land Rights Act continues to stop those outcomes being realised easily or even fairly. So I challenge everybody who's come to this seminar today to think about that and to understand that land councils wish to be willing partners in these very important renewable projects, but they need to be treated in a way that will allow that to happen to the benefit of their members as the Land Rights Act prescribes. Thank you for letting me share. Thanks very much, Stephen. And Graham? Thank you, T. Thank you, that was really, really interesting. I'm going to very briefly cut down my introduction because I wanted to leave as much time as possible to hear from Lily O'Neill. Lily is a research fellow at the Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research and the Energy Change Institute. She's a lawyer. Um, she's been looking at agreement making and dispute resolution processes in relation to natural resources. And she is going to talk about some comparisons um, with uh, North America. So thanks very much, Lily. I'll hand over to you. I think we will go a little bit over time, um, but, but well worth it for such a fantastic contribution. Thank you. So, um, look, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I sit through uh, the Tung Tungurung people of Northeast Victoria, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, it's a beautiful area around where I live. I think we're just about the only people who are not in lockdown at the moment. Um, and um, their custodianship of this area um, has just been wonderful over millennia. Thank you. Now, I'm gonna be very, very quick and I'm gonna end, I hope, on what is a really positive note um, to this um, fantastic seminar. Um, 
And it's a positive note because I'm going to take you on a little trip. We're going to step in an aeroplane and we're going to fly 24 hours to North America, to Canada. This is about, you know, this trip of the imagination is about the closest any of us are going to get to Canada in the next little while. And I'm going to talk about what is possible. And it's what is possible, um, but only in the Canadian example, with significant government investment and significant government supportive policies. So this is the Canadian success story of Indigenous people and clean energy. This is a story that dates back to about 2009, but really ramped up um, from 2015. So what has it resulted in? Essentially, um, Indigenous people in Canada are at the absolute forefront of the clean energy revolution. They're currently significantly involved, um, as a lawyer, I like to know what that means, I don't quite know, um, in 197 clean energy projects over one megawatt. A study um, from just this year found that um, of renewable energy projects on Indigenous owned land in Canada, 40 out of 114 had um, community equity in those projects, they were owned by the um, community. And a recent survey of Indigenous leaders in Canada reported that renewable energy could um, materially support holistic community, economic and social health. In Canada, when community clean energy and even larger scale clean energy is talked about, um, policymakers naturally think of um, Canadian Indigenous people, First Nations, Aboriginal and, and Metis people. Now, how did this Sorry, here we go to the next slide that showed, this is from 2019. Um, things have moved on since then, but I couldn't find an update. And I'd like to draw all your attention to some of, um, some of these key figures here. This is um, clean energy on indigenous owned land in Canada, $2.5 billion worth of estimated profits for communities over 15 years. Um, impact, um, 15,300 person years of direct indigenous employment. 299 Indigenous people employed in operations um, and 842 million estimated um, Indigenous employment incomes in Canadian dollars. How did this happen? It happened out of um, a series of government policies at both the federal and province level called the Canadian Pact for a Green New Deal, which emerged um, partly out of the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, that inquiry into um, those appalling, that appalling policy for um, boarding schools for taking Aboriginal children and um, um, so-called educating them, housing them, um, we've seen recently killing them, um, away from their families. And, and that Green New Deal, that pact, um, really links the energy transition with the goal of achieving reconciliation with Indigenous people. And when you have that high level commitment to ensuring that Indigenous people are absolutely at the core of the energy revolution and transition, then you filter down and all other government policies, both at a federal and provincial level, really take that up on board. What were some of the policy levers that the success story used? Um, beneficial feed-in tariffs, price adders, um, which offer above market fixed price contracts for Indigenous communities, also uh, beneficial procurement policies, including for power purchase agreements. And what that, so we've heard, um, particularly Justin at the start, talked about the wonderful things that um, some companies are doing and are choosing to do. And certainly um, our research shows that's extremely important, um, but even more important than those um, optional voluntary things that companies are doing are government policies and government um, funding. And we see that too in community energy for uh, non-Indigenous communities here in Australia as well. Um, where I live in Victoria, there's not a day that goes past where um, some community energy project isn't being touted along with significant government investment in Victoria. So we're not just talking about First Nations communities who need these beneficial policies and funding, we're talking about all communities. But what the Canadian example shows is government policies and funding are essential. Now, I just, um, I'll finish there because I understand we're under tight time constraints, but I'd like to make a plug um, for a couple of um, things that our team here at the Australian National University are about to release. So several of the present presenters today have talked about um, agreement making for renewable energy projects. Uh, we are shortly in the next week or so to um, release our 
our guide to agreement making for clean energy projects. And we've included many of the um, aspects that people have talked about today. And I'd really, um, it's a plain language one. It runs to about six pages. It doesn't have the usual academic waffle. And I'd really encourage everyone to read that um, when that comes out. I'd also like to um, do a shout out to um, several, I think several people from Original Power are also on this call, in particular Donna Fraser. So Original Power um, are a terrific organisation. Karina Nolan is their executive director and founder. She's a Yorta Yorta descendant. And they have recently, they're about recently or about to launch, Donna could um, correct me, their um, Indigenous Clean Energy Network. And Donna Fraser is the inaugural coordinator of that. And I'd encourage you all please to look up Original Power and the Indigenous Clean Energy Network and Donna and get in contact with her about, um, you know, um, forming an alliance with that terrific organisation. I'm going to end there because I know we're short of time, but the, what the Canadian example shows is that it is absolutely possible, probable and likely that First Nations people in Australia can be leaders in this area, but Lobby, lobby your local policy makers. It needs government investment, it needs government policies. Thank you. Thank you. I think that brings us to the end. Um, as I mentioned, we've covered an enormous amount of material. We've recorded this and that will be available for all participants and beyond. And we also have um, plans to continue to contribute to the policy discussion and um, and uh, you know other other contribute in other ways to what is going to be an incredible it's a critical moment now but will be an ongoing um ongoing development where aboriginal landholders um, could generate quite significant benefits